they're talking about the development of Christian philosophy. And before we can go very far, what's philosophy? Love of wisdom. <clears throat> give, give me a, a, a definition of what it covers. A belief system. A, a reason, a, always a um, logical reason for being. Okay, you're getting closer. Explanation okay. for a reason for being. It's, it's, a, it's a study of the existence of things uh, and the order of things. Uh, and um, so it, it's very much in tune with the, the uh, discussion we're having about folks who uh, tried to study and try to understand God, and they tried to understand it in a variety of different ways. And, uh, uh, so let's let's start here. Let's. Uh, she she talked a little bit about the the rift in the when the Western bishops decided to add on. That the whole that uh, phrase in the Nicene uh, Creed. I'm going to take this off so you can understand me a little better. I think I'm I'm safe yeah. at this distance. The Nicene Creed originally did not include the phrase uh, "the Holy Spirit proceeded not only from the Father but also from the Son." Those in the Greek world objected to that. Those in the Western world the bishops went ahead and added that in. Now, why was that significant? Well, it's significant because if, in fact, you can rationally develop the concept of God from looking at Jesus Christ, then that was their, their belief. They, they believed that uh, there was no rational way to envision God. It also gave them a, a view that man could become God. That this Jesus Christ became God. And that was contrary to what the Greek, Greek uh, church believed. So, um, could it, you repeat that, Jonathan, what you just said? Okay. Um, it caused a rift. And the rift was because the Greeks, which then became the Greek Orthodox Church, believed that you could not rationally develop an image or concept of God. That he was greater than anything that existed. He was greater than the greatest that we could imagine. The West, on the other hand, saw in Jesus Christ uh, the human epitome or the avatar of God. And therefore, uh, you could you could rationalize what God was like by looking at the life of Jesus Christ. Okay, does that make sense? So that caused a rift because the, the Greeks basically said. God is not, you, you can't derive uh, any image of God from looking at man. That God is so far beyond and so much greater, magnificent, we cannot imagine him in our mind. Um, so what happened you were is, saying, in other words, that was a God out of reach. Yes, yes, <clears throat> right. So um, following the, the uh, what James has put out here. In the West, St. Augustine's interpretation of the Trinity led to the interpretation of the Philosophia at the precise moment when the Greeks and Muslims were starting to lose faith in it. <clears throat> well, what was the Philosophia? Philosophia was the philosophers. They were beginning the, the study we now call philosophy. It's the study of existence and, and the order of things. Well, if you can study it and come to a rational explanation of it, the Greeks rejected that because God is beyond our reason, beyond our description. Okay. For Greek philosophers, the Greeks have already mean, bypassed the philosophers. Yes, yes. And the West were just discovering them. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. And, and that's what's interesting too is that so much of what we assume originated in the West originated in the East. So much of our science and our philosophy originated in the East for the Greeks. So. Uh, the Greek philosophers, the Greeks uh, and the Muslims. Yes, yes. For the Greek philosophers, the study of God remained precisely that. It was confined to the contemplation of God in the essential, essentially mystical doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation. That's the that's the Greeks in the East. In the West, 
as, as we studied in a variety of ways when we started the history of Christianity. In, in the West, they were trying to define what the Trinity was, what the incarnation was. They were trying to make it tangible. And so it, it became uh, a rift that exists even to this day. Um, Celtic uh, philosopher Eretina believed that faith and reason were not mutually exclusive. Now, what does that mean? Faith and reason are not mutually exclusive. But they go to work together. They, they can work together. You can have faith and still apply reason to your belief. Um, the, um, the scripture and the writings of the fathers could be eliminated by this, this, uh, this simple <laughs> disciplines of logic and rational inquiry, but they did not mean literal interpretation. The, I like this phrase, theology was a kind of poetry. So it, it, he's saying that rational mind can tackle the concept of theology and of God, but at the same time, it's poetry. It's not representational necessarily. It, it operates in symbols. The first Christian crusade uh, considered the Christ is the feudal Lord of the Crusaders rather than the incarnate uh, logos or word. Uh, and uh, and the, so Clement of Alexandria taught that Yahweh and the God of the philosophers were one and the same. So let's take a look at some of the philosophers, specifically in, in the uh, Christian uh, Western world. Anselm of Canterbury. Uh, he said, unless you believe, you will not understand. And his prayer was, for I do not seek to understand in order to have faith, but I have faith in order to understand. For I believe in even this, I shall not understand unless I have faith. So what does that say to you? Do you believe that? Those of you online can contribute too. I'm assuming you can hear us. Well, I think I think understanding probably um, would help us. Um, well, you have to have faith, I think, to understand the spiritual world, and and if you don't have that faith then it would be difficult to understand something um, because in your mind, that's the way that you think. Yeah, and, and I think there's also a premise under, underlying that that says, you know, you have to have faith to understand the nature of God. You have to have faith. Um, but he seeks understanding in order to have faith but faith uh, generates that understanding. There's a foundation for that understanding. Um, so it's not an intellectual application. Uh, I commit myself in order that I may understand. That's where the word credo, credo comes from. It's an attitude of trust and loyalty. Uh, he believed God, the existence of God. Uh, Clinton, you had a comment? Yeah, that statement there. Um, sounds like a precursor to the scientific method to me, because the scientific method, you have to come up with a hypothesis. Theoretically, you believe your hypotheses, right? Um, it's a belief, and then you study to prove it wrong or correct so that you understand. So I, 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 when I saw that or read it, I was like, oh, that sounds like the scientific method. Someone came up with it earlier in religion. Yeah. Very, very true. Well, and, and it, it also, the philosophers were the ones that came up with a lot of things because they were using logic. So science and math and everything else. So that makes sense. So uh, Absalom uh, believed in the existence of God could be argued rationally. Again, you see there, here's the, the rift from the Greek church. Uh, because they would say, you can't argue it rationally. 
uh, ontological argument, which, which what's an ontological argument? What is reality? It's a reality, but it's also often focused on what is the nature of God, or the existence of God. It's an argument for the existence of God. Um, and it says, if such an organizational structure is true, then God must exist. That organizational structure is basically the world, that there is, there is structure to the world, there's structure to our existence, therefore God must exist. <clears throat> And then, but he also goes on to define God as a being that which no greater can be conceived. In other words, God is beyond what we can conceive. If you can conceive it, that's not that's not the totality of God. Do you believe that? I I believe that it's not the totality of God because I think He's much greater than we can imagine. So you know. You just can't wrap your mind all around a being who can have everyone's interests and, in, you know, be, in, be the creator of all things. You just can't wrap, wrap your mind around the immensity. One of the things that the philosophers will come back to saying is that two, one, two things. First of all, God is greater than anything you can imagine. And secondly, that because we have, because we can imagine God, God must exist. Why would we have this concept of this idea that there's a God if in fact God did not exist? It's kind of like when you have one of those awe moments when you know you see something magnificent in nature, you know, or the first time you ever are on a mountain, the first time you ever see the ocean. You know, and it's it's kind of you know you just can't wrap your mind around that it's it's so beautiful or awe-inspiring. Well, that's a very good example. Uh, I remember the first time I saw the ocean was out in the Portland area, uh, the coast, and uh, and it, it's immense. I mean, I I grew up around the Great Lakes, and they're pretty big. But when you see this thing and realize how far it goes, it's pretty immense. Well, then wait till you get on a ship in the middle of the ocean and imagine how, how insignificant we seem, how very immense that is. Well, that, we can still imagine. We can still imagine the boundaries of an ocean or of a lake. Uh, and they're saying God is beyond that. He's beyond anything we can, we can imagine. Um, and... The, the author points out that the flaw is that if you can imagine ten dollars, a hundred dollars, uh, but you cannot make money, uh, but you cannot make money a reality in your pocket. So, uh, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, good, have, good, uh, good pocket, you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it takes some action. It's not pure imagination. So. Uh, Peter Abelard. Uh, versus Bernard, the two uh, abbots. Um, um, Abelard was a charismatic uh, philosopher, uh, developed an explanation of the Trinity, emphasizing the divine unity of the expanse, uh, expanse of the uh, distinction of the three uh, persons. Um, developed a rationale for the atonement. Christ had been crucified to awaken compassion in us, and by doing so, he became our savior. Um, he came into conflict with Bernard, uh, charismatic uh, abbot of Cistercian. Uh, Cistercian. I can't. I'm going to stumble over these words. But, um, anyhow, he, he became one of the most powerful uh, abbots in the, in the uh, Europe. He he just distrusted uh, intellectualism of scholars and accused Abelard of attempting to bring the merit of the Christian church to naught. So he accused him of lacking Christian love because uh, he relied on this intellectual or rational approach to defining God. Uh, Abelard uh, was summoned to, or he summoned uh, into the uh, Council of Sins and uh, Basically, that 
the story in the book is more detailed, I think, but basically, uh, the man was, was basically crucified for, for his, his beliefs. Um, Bernard's Christianity was unbridled subjectivity with no attempt to explain the mysteries of God. So Bernard versus Abelard. Abelard is, is saying that the rational, intellectual approach we can take to understanding God. Uh, Bernard is saying that's not that's not the case. He's saying it's uh, unbridled subjectivity uh, and that there's no way that we can fully understand uh, the nature and being of, of God. Um, Bernard's Crusaders uh, <clears throat> show your life love for Christ by killing infidels. He was, I think, one of the first to send uh, Christians on, on the crusade. So again, we, we have this conflict even in, in the West between the, the uh, philosophers and the abbots of the, the uh, community. Okay, so that showing love. Well, um, you know, one of the problems, one of the, the real risks that caused that existed between the Eastern and Western Church is that when the Western Church sent the Crusaders into the Holy Land and on the way, they ended up attacking and killing uh, some of the, the people of the Eastern Church, the Greek Church. Well, that's not a good way to make friends and you know, uh, mend fences. So they really did have this view that somehow for Christ, they were crusaders. And every infidel, that's a non-believer, that they killed was a strike for Christianity. Um, it's one of the, I think it's one of the, one of the errors of Christianity that we would rather forget because it, it really was not a representative of what Christ stood for, what he what he spoke for. And that and at that time during the Crusades, the Christians also believed that 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 God was a warrior warrior and that he was helping them conquer. Yeah. Yeah. But it still goes on today. Yeah. yeah. And it does. And a lot of it draws from the Old Testament belief. Uh, or, or the stories of the Old Testament clearly that God is a warrior God, that he's on <clears throat> our side, Jews and Israelis, and that no one can stand against us because he's on our side. The problem comes when they begin to be conquered by the Persians and Syrians, and uh, how do you continue to claim that your God is the God who has control over the whole world if, in fact, you're losing the battle? Well, uh, the rationale of many of the Old Testament prophets that we've studied was, well, people have become evil. Uh, it's not God, it's evil. We're being punished for it. Well, then we, we generally start moving beyond that at some point in history. At least some people start moving beyond it at some point in history. Well, just look at, at you know, the uh, fight between the Catholics and the Protestants, you know, they both believe in God and both think that their version of God is the true God. So, you know, it's it's just a struggle between belief systems yeah. so much of the time. Um, a side note is that the uh, Cistercian uh, order um, is often viewed as the inspiration for the uh, Arthurian legend. And the reason for that is because uh, of our dear friend uh, uh, Abelard, who, uh, who basically was one of the instigators of the, the, the early crusade. Okay, now we get to St. Thomas Aquinas. Anybody here, here know of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas? Okay. okay he, he tried for a synthesis of Augustine and Greek philosophy. So he, he tried to uh, take a look at both the rational and the mystical aspects of, of, uh, of God, of the nature of God. In the Summa uh, Theologica, Theologiae, I'm slaughtering that too, I'm sure. Uh, Aquinas impressed um, by Rusty's implication 
or explication from Aristotle. While he did not believe that such mysteries of the Trinity could be proven by reason, he believed that God's real nature was inaccessible to time. Hence, in the last resort, all that man knows of God is to know that he does not know him, since he knows that what God is surpasses all that we can understand of him. So we're back to that circular. We can't understand God because uh, all that we know of him is insufficient to truly know him. Um, Aquinas defined God by returning to God's own definition of himself. Uh, Moses, I am what I am. <clears throat> Aristotle had said that God was necessary being. What's a necessary being? Why would Aristotle say that God was a necessary being? We wouldn't be without him. Yeah. Where, where do we come from if there is not a creator? Why are we here? Um, and it, that ties in with the, the concept of the unknown, known, uh, a number of ways in which God has been described as indescribable, basically. Aquinas accordingly linked the God of philosophers with the God of the Bible by calling God he who is. We, yes. Um, what does that mean when he says, when the author says that Aquinas linked the God of the philosophers to the God of the Bible. Tell me, how do you describe the God of the Bible? As indescribable. Okay. <laughs> Powerful, <clears throat> majestic, warrior king, creator, uh, vengeful, all those kinds of things to represent the God of the Bible. What did Aristotle say? That God was more than our imagination could understand, but that there was a reason that he existed. No, and there, there's an order to existence. There's a structure to existence. And so Aristotle is, uh, but Aquinas is, is combining that view that there's an order and structure and we can understand nature and, and the universe with that God of the Bible that is mystical and beyond comprehension. Um, God was not simply another being like ourselves. Definition of God, the definition of God as being itself was appropriate because it does not signify any particular form of being, but rather being in itself. So God is simply it. It exists. Uh, he who is. Portion. Yes. And she. And she. Oh, and she, yeah. Well, or, actually, the, the better term is it because it is genderless. So uh, it is who it is. So John, Jonathan, is, isn't this saying that we cannot, no one can actually know all of God? Okay. Yeah, yes, that's exactly it. But keep in mind that the Aristotle, Aristotle was trying to say, and Aquinas, following his pattern, was trying to say that, yes, we can't understand everything, but we certainly can understand much of God. We can, we can look at Jesus Christ. We can look at other representative through history uh, of, of individuals like St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, and we can say God is like the best of those people. Or specifically with, with Jesus, we can say, well, God is, is inquisitive and knowledgeable because Christ as a child went to the temple. He is compassionate because of many times he heals. Uh, he is this, he is that, because Jesus is this and that. Jonathan? And your, yes. I, I wonder if Aquinas was trying to um, partially account for uh, why there are so many different views or visions of God in the Bible that we've talked about. Um, the God who is close and intimate and, and visits with people, and then the God who's very distant and threatening and powerful and dangerous and sometimes angry. Um, and, and in doing that, he is using what 
uh, Moses' experience was, I am what I am, uh, to mean that all of those are God. All of those experiences are God, and yet none of those experiences are the entirety of what God is. Does that make sense? Yes. I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's very, very accurate. Any other comments? Okay, then let's, let's move on a little bit. Aquinas had five proofs of God's existence, and we kind of touched on some of this already. Uh, one is that God is a prime mover. I mean, something must set the universe in, in order. Something must have started the universe. Um, so he is the prime mover. The very fact that we exist means that God exists. There must have been a beginning that cannot be an infinite series of causes. So in other words, you know, if I eat uh, eggs and bacon this morning and the bacon is, is old and moldy, then I'm going to get sick. That's a cause and effect. Uh, Aristotle is saying there aren't, you can't trace back enough causes to not have a prime mover, to not have a God to exist. There's got to be something that puts everything in motion. Uh, it's kind of a redundant to the prime mover kind of concept. The argument of con uh, contingency demands the universe, of, universe uh, demands the existence of a necessary being. Uh, again, the whole idea that there must be someone, something, it, that exists for the universe to, to exist. The uh, Aristotle talks about the hierarchy of excellence in the in this world, it implies a perfect that is best of all perfect or perfection that is beyond all. So if, if a flower is beautiful and a field of flowers is more beautiful and you, at our age, in our space age, we can get up and we can look at the planet and see how beautiful it is. And you can go even further and see that the universe, the galaxy is just absolutely beautiful. There's gotta be something beyond all that. So there's got to be a perfection beyond what we can envision, what we can see. Comments? Five, um, the argument of design, order and purpose that we see in the universe cannot simply be the result of chance. You know, they, they talked about how if the Earth rotated on its axis just a little bit more or a little bit closer to the sun or a little bit further away, life as we know it would not exist. So there's something that has created this absolute perfect situation that allows us to exist. And, and that's the design theory. Somehow it was designed in such a way by some thing that it's that I that I am God, uh, that, that is again a, a proof that his of his existence, his or her existence. Sorry. I come from a patriarchal society and I can't get over the uh him there. Um so how do you react to those five five proofs? Yes. Jeremy, would you verbalize what that means? So, <laughs> so, well, is it, are any of those still a good argument today? Does, does your faith seem to depend upon there being God as the prime mover of the universe? I think that's a postulate. <clears throat> postulate. Okay. Define postulate. It's some it's a statement that um, you base other things on. Okay. A statement that is accepted without proof. Okay. As a theorem. Okay. Thank you. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Um how about there must be a beginning? There cannot, there cannot be an infinite series of causes. Another postulate? 
my mm-hmm. mind is uh, my, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a math guy, mm-hmm. but my mind goes to here pi. 3.14159265. Well, wait a minute. There was a beginning, but there is not an end. And I'm one of those little digits someplace in that spectrum. I got somebody before me and I've got somebody after me. Well, then, then who came up with the concept of pi? I don't know if it was pretty good when I ate it. <laughs> well, before you ate it, where did it come from? <laughs> Mathematician. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I, I mean, where does the pie come from? Where does the apple and the tree come from? Where does the tree come from? Yeah. Where does the earth of the tree grow in come from? Pi comes from, from the comparing the circumference of a circle to the radius. That's where pi comes from. Okay, and who defines the circumference? And who defines mathematician? <laughs> and where did the math- mathematician come from? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, all I'm trying to do is say, that's the, the whole concept, that somehow we can't figure out what started this, unless there was a prime mover, unless there was a God. Uh, I, tell and, you, I tell you something. Yes. God loves irrational numbers. <laughs> Wouldn't you say so? Yeah. Wait, you, you love irrational or rational numbers? Irrational. Because irrational. Irrational. there's so okay. many of them. <laughs> and they never end. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, some of these I think still are arguments we use today. Uh, the argument for design is probably one of the strongest. Is somehow or other, how can there be, how can this whole universe just be chance? You know, scientists talk to talk about a big bang, but then what was there before the big bang? It was a big implosion. Okay, and before the big implosion, what another was big bang. <laughs> okay, so we go on to an infinity of implosions and explosions that create. That, that's what I think. Okay, that's my opinion. <laughs> and where do you go from there? <laughs> Maybe we go to the next slide. And, and this, you know, chance thing. They're they're discovering all sorts of new planets around suns and that sort of thing. And so far, they haven't found one that fits well for life to exist on. Another Goldilocks planet? Mm-hmm. Well, get this, though. This is what, this is the kicker. And I will ask why, not how, but why. Do we live today in order to see the moon as it is? Because it used to be closer, but it is a perfect distance from the from the Earth, so that when it goes in front of the Sun, we can enjoy a total eclipse. Now, that blows my mind. Now, yeah. is there another planet in the universe that I have? Yeah. Oh. Right. Yeah. But we are here to enjoy it. That's the kicker. One of the dilemmas of the rationalistic approach to understanding God is that we just keep getting more and more questions. Mm-hmm. Can you repeat that, Jonathan? <laughs> one of the one of the problems with the rationalistic approach to defining God is that we keep generating more questions. More questions. Yeah. Questions upon questions upon questions. But that grows out of our incapacity, apparently, to know it all at one time without adding increments to it. So, again, we're we're saying that the human mind is limited, but we have this concept of God. So, if we're limited, why do we all have this concept of God? Even atheists have a concept that God doesn't exist. Why do they have where did that come from? So, one of the arguments and how for, for the existence of, of God. But part of, part of our understanding of God then is that He is active in pulling us toward increased understanding of truth, yeah. increased commitment of what is what is right, so that it's a, a moving situation or a dynamic situation. Right. 
And, and I think that's what we believe. But this is going to be quite different than what the mystics talk about in, in that chapter. I mean, we really are trying to, we talk about trying, the philosophers try to deal with how do we conceptualize God so we understand them better in a rational way that our mind can understand. And we're going to get to the mystics who basically say, oh, forget all that. And it's this interior experience. So, but that's, that's Merlin's. It's kind of like language, you know, there may not be a translation into another language because they don't have that concept in their mm -hmm. understanding. Well, well, like Eskimos yes. have 500 different words for Snoke. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we have one. Maybe two. Um, on adventure, Aquinas Franciscan contemporary tried to articulate philosophy with religious experience through the mutual enrichment of both. So on adventure was really trying to merge the two, say that both religious experience and philosophy can be merged together to help us better understand the nature of God. In a threefold way, he believed that the Trinity could be proved by unaided, unaided natural reason by avoiding the dangers of rationalistic chauvinism, by stressing the importance of spiritual experience as an essential component of the idea of God. Okay, rationalistic chauvinism, what does that mean? What's chauvinism? Saying that you're the best. Yeah. So bad. I understand. I understand. Uh, there are, you know, I understand everything. Therefore, I'm a chauvinist. I, I have this conception. A rationalistic chauvinist basically means that you believe that rationalism can explain everything. Your, your <clears throat> view is that rationalism is the view. There's not another view. Well, uh, Quantum Venture is saying. He doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe that's the only way, that there is spiritual experience that supplements our understanding and is an essential component of our idea of God, our understanding of God. But rationalism and spiritual experience. He believed Francis of Assisi, uh, the founder of his order, was a great exemplar of Christian life. Uh, he answered ontological proof, knows that and that proof of the existence of God uh, in his discussion of uh, Francis as an epiphany. What's an epiphany? Uh -huh. An aha uh -huh moment. But it also means basically an experience with God, with the, the supreme being. It's you know, an enlightenment. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He argued that Francis had achieved an excellence in his life that seemed more than human. So it was possible for us, while we still lived here below, to see and understand that the best is what is that which is. Try that again. To see and understand that the best is that which, then nothing better can be imagined. I love the language of, of some in the book, but basically, that there, you can't imagine something better. There's some, nothing more perfect. Uh, if we entered into ourselves. Plato and Augustine had both advised we would find God's image reflected in our own inner, inner world. So it, it's, in a sense, it's a kind of an inner contemplation, but it's also a rationalistic uh, approach to understand uh, ourselves and God. Liturgy is important, but a Christian must first descend into the depths of his own self, where he would be transported in ecstasy above the intellect and find a vision of God that transcends our limited human notions. So it is a personal journey. It is an internal journey. It's based on rationalism, but it has to be combined with the spiritual experience, which helps us better understand through this ecstatic experience, this epiphany, to better understand God and the nature of existence. That's what we get into the mysticism that we're going yes. to get into. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So from philosophy to mysticism, uh, Ibn Sina, Ibn Sina uh, became more of a mystic, Sufi, at the end of his life, believing it was possible for people to attain the vision of God that is philosophically sound, but without using logic as rationality. Uh, instead, using Im imaginal the tools of symbolism and imagery. So there, and I'm going to read most of this to, to Marilyn, but 
that there's that movement toward uh, using symbols to represent God and not necessarily seeing the humanity, the mirror of God in humanity. Uh, Al Ghazali reconciled this confusion of Sufi thoughts that God lays outside their realm of sense, perception, and logical thought. Muslim philosophy had become inseparable from spirituality and a more myth mythical, mystical uh, discussion of God. Uh, Philosophers did not believe that you had to convince yourself of God's existence rationally before you could have a mystical experience. So you don't the mystical experience, and this goes back to some of the other philosophers, but basically faith can precede knowledge, but the knowledge can also precede faith. That it's a, it's a cycle. The thing I, I like, uh, the last statement I think in, in her chapter, the God of, of philosophers was being rapidly overtaken, overtaken by the God of the mystics. Now again, we're talking about uh, in the three monotheists monotheistic thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we need to take a couple minute break here while I see if I can bring up Marilyn's PowerPoint and it will change the places on the doc I share here. So this is chapter seven, um, The God of the Mystics and um, challenging chapter for me. So hopefully I have made sense of it. What I tried to do is to first just give you a little bit of background of what a small mysticism and then um and and then the three religions but then spend a lot of time by put things in in chronological order of the mystics and their beliefs so i'll get into more depth about who the mystics are and what their beliefs are um, after I just give you kind of a short background. So this will probably just. So um, first of all, at the beginning of the chapter, um, they talk about a personal God. And um, basically it's talking about appreciating the human personality. Um, Judaism said that Yahweh began as a highly personal deity with human likes and dislikes. Um, and Yahweh's thoughts were not our thoughts and ways, they were above our own. Um, Christianity talked about um, how the human person was the center of religious life and introduced the Trinity. And then Islam, um, God sees and judges like human beings. So that's kind of a, a, a short definition of God. The, some of the issues with personal God are that um, we're idolizing in our own image of what we think God is, um, the needs and desires. And we assume he loves what we do and hates what we hate. Um, as a person, it insinuates gender as well. So can you think of any other um, things that um, would be challenges to just believe God from a personal perspective. The fact that we just, you know, what we've been talking about, that we can't imagine his, his entirety, his depth and width and <laughs> It imposes limitations on God. That's good. Yeah, and I think, you know, as you see in early Christianity, their definitions of the personal God were meant to fit their, what their beliefs were. And that wasn't always the best solution. You know, he was a warrior God. And as Arlene said earlier, that's still going on today. Jerry. Yeah, uh, I, I would add to what's up there. Uh, that maybe it's there and I'm just not seeing it, but that it assumes a communication between God and man. In other words, that there is interaction of intelligent communication. 
Yeah, that's, did everybody hear that, that there's interaction? Um, it's assuming a communication or interaction between you and God, that it would be basically the same for everyone or personal to that person, but everyone would assume it's the same. The contemplative religions, there is really getting a little bit more into what we call mysticism. So um, there's a dialogue that becomes silent thought. The three, all three religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity develop this mystical tradition. And God transcends um, personal to become more impersonal like Nirvana um, or the Eastern beliefs um, um, from Brahman Atman. Uh, the early Western religions, uh, God by his, by his eternal tributes um, uh, is believed goodness, justice, love, omnip omnipotence, meaning unlimited power, great power. Thought and prayers should liberate the soul mm -hmm. from the body. And religious art was becoming a uh, representation by depicting events in life of Jesus or the saints. And we'll talk about that later on because that also plays a role in mysticism in some ways. Uh, also in early Western religions, um, they saw God by his eternal tributes. Well, I think I've already, I already mentioned this, goodness, justice, love. Um, and then, um, am I repeating myself? I think I am. I think this is a, oh, okay. I think this is a duplicate slide. I think I cleaned it up after I sent it to you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, um, and in the early Eastern religions, uh, Christian experience of God was characterized by light. Um, later on, it'll be called enlightenment. Um, in the Greek religions, because Greek was a lot was was there a lot longer. There's a lot more to talk about. Like they saw God making Himself accessible in ceaseless activities. Uh, they discovered practices that hadn't been used for centuries in the Oriental religions. Um, prayer and psychosomatic activity or physical illness causing mm -hmm. mental conflict or stress um, was prayer was used. Um, they didn't they didn't use Im imagery initially in the Greek religions and vision um was silent so there wasn't a lot of um talking when um mysticism was involved um god god's essence and his energies in in the world allowed us to experience some something of the divine okay so um god's energy descends to us the divine energy is from the old testament it's called the Greeks also thought of deification as enlightenment. They were inspired by the transfigured Christ and the, import, and the important feast of the East, Eastern Orthodox churches that was called the Epiphany. And actually Catholicism has that same feast um, of the Epiphany. The Byzantine art was not representative. And this is where we'll get into, they call it more iconic. And we'll talk about the iconoclast iconoclasts in that icons were were meant to represent the mystical experience and that's why they weren't as realistic as as we think of christ and the stories of the bible it became more iconic with the byzantine art and then by the sixth century um, supernatural was a common in dreams and imagination and often portray that iconic art real um, in a realized dream. 
by the eighth century, uh, the icons were so common that Greek, the Greek church began to dispute, dispute them and say they weren't, that they were more like idols. And, and if artists only depicted the, hum, the humanity of Jesus, he was guilty of, um, yeah, Nestorianism. It's a, it's a heretical belief that the human and the divine nature of Christ was distinct. And we talked about that in the history of Christianity and how that was a big conflict. So myth, mysticism, and mystery. It was der derived from the Greek verb mysterion to close the eyes and mouth. It was rooted in darkness. The West used myth um, to mean lie or something that needed to be cleared up. But again, mysticism didn't start in the West. So that's why it took a little bit longer um, for this to catch on. Mythology often used to explain the inner world of the psyche. So we can start talking about the mysticism timeline and the, the people and the practices that were involved throughout time. And I thought it was better to put this in a timeline perspective because sometimes it's, it was hard in the book to follow jumping back and forth because she's a really good author, but um, you know, it, it just became really confusing to know that a practice was mentioned first when it was really, you know, 500 to a thousand, you know, years later. So I tried to, to do that. So maybe this would make more sense. So um, it's called, and I'm going to probably mispronounce some of these, um, around 100 BC to um, a thousand years um, after the birth of Christ. Uh, it's called Merkaba or Merkava mysticism it's a it's a school of early jewish mysticism centered on visions and you know i think there was a lot of mysticism going on but it wasn't it wasn't talked about as such i think that people there it's really interesting as we go through this timeline to figure out what was really going on with these practices you know was there more than just meditation what were there it, it often talks about, you know, even um, seizures and other things for people to become so um, meditative and so deep in their trances that you really wonder about all of these practices. And, and so it becomes very interesting. So in the, in the book of um, Ezekiel or the, they call Hecalot um, or palaces and literature, uh, those stories were about the ascent of the heavenly palaces, the throne of God. And I don't know if you remember that. We talked about that um, before with the, the book of the prophets and, and Ezekiel's dream. That became kind of an early mystic thing that people concentrated on when they started trying to envision God through their practices. The main corpus of Merkaba literature was composed from 200 to 700 CE. So that's really early in the timeline. Later references to the chariot. Remember we talked about that. I can't remember that was earlier, um, maybe in, in the last book that we read. Yeah, it was the prophets and their visions. Um, the tradition can be found in the literature of, okay, I'm gonna say this wrong, Chesedi, Ashkenaz in the Middle Ages, a major text um, in that tradition. So um, in, um, well, this must be the, okay. Again, um, this is more of, of Makawa. Um, he'll gate, it says that, that the, the mystic would gaze into the recesses of his heart and see the seven halls um, with his eyes. He was moving from hall to hall. Mystics used a sonorous, uh, grandial, 
grand eloquent. grand eloquent language versus the direct style of the rabbis. The throne of mysticism flourished along with the rabbinic academics. So it was not just, it was even the rabbis were starting to practice mysticism. It wasn't just individuals um, that hadn't been um, trained in the religion. In the second and third century, um, Jews wanted to re wanted a reprieve from their persecution. And so um, they became more involved with this divine realm. And then around 322, probably the most, and still practiced today's, the original meaning of Sufi is to have been one who wears Suf, woolen clothes, simple because Muhammad was really trying to um, simplify and and make a difference in people's lives. So he wanted, so he was trying to not, um, I, I don't know, uh, to simplify or um, simplify um, your life, your individual life, so you could help others. Safa I mean, is, is an uh, Arabic um, a term that means purity. Uh, this is also part of um, uh, Sufism. Uh, Self-purification is also widely used in, in Sufism. They were combined um, by Ruba, uh, let's see, Ruha Bari around 322 to means Sufi is the one who wears wool on top of purity. So that was originally the Sufi practices that began. Um, and I remember working with someone that did practice as a Sufi and I looked up those terms at the time and found it quite um, interesting um, to realize, you know, how prevalent it is today still. The word comes from the term uh, al Sufa, the people of Sufa or bench. And that means people that were a group of impoverished, impoverished companions of, Huma, of Muhammad who held regular gatherings um, and were considered some of the first Sufis. Maybe I should, should stop there. And maybe we, we will continue next week. I'm not sure I'm gonna get through all of it.